my name is Kurt Davis with Real Estate Wealth Coaching, and today I have a very special guest joining me. Gene, I'm going to try and pronounce this uh, correctly. It's Gene Guarino. Oh, man, you did great. Good for That's you. Right. If you didn't have the little uh, subtitle there on how to pronounce it correctly, I might have said uh, Gerino or something <laughs> exactly. different. But uh, So I appreciate you taking the time to uh, let me interview you today. So, Thanks for inviting me. I appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. Well, you know, like I said, this this is something different, and I'm fascinated as well. So I feel if, if I have some interest in it, there's probably a lot of people that are going to be very interested in hearing about this. So with that being said, Gene is the founder of the Residential Assisted Living Academy. The RAL Academy is the premier source for education in owning, operating, and investing in residential assisted living and senior housing. Gene has trained thousands of people from across the country on how to turn single family homes into cash flow machines. The RAL Academy's motto is do good and do well. Gene has written four books and hosted three radio shows and has spoken in five, uh, five countries and over 50 cities in the last year alone. So Gene, thanks for being here today. Absolutely. Thank you again for inviting me. Yes. Now, uh, for those of you who are watching and who watch our videos, if you have not yet, click the subscribe button in the bottom corner. And if you like this video after you've watched it, make sure you click the like button and leave a comment. We'll certainly try to answer any questions you have. We love it when people leave us feedback. So, Gene, obviously we're going to get into residential assisted living. You're going to tell us all about it. I've got many questions I'm going to try to ask in the short time that you have, but you were not always involved in real estate. Who were you? What were you before real estate? <laughs> All right. Well, I, you're going to have to go back a long way. So <laughs> when I was a teenager, I was a professional musician. So I played the drums, little keyboard, sang. Uh, and that was a long time ago, 16, 17, 18. And along the way, we had a music school, recording studio, small record label. The landlord that we had for two years when I was 16 to 18, he was pretty bad. So the He'd pick up the rent on a Friday and be knocking on the door on Monday saying, pay the rent. He never gave us a receipt. So it was two years. And at the end of two years, we said, that's it. We're either shutting it down or we're going to go ahead and get our own place. And I looked up the street, saw a for sale sign in front of a house, two doors away. We uh, went, grabbed, literally took the sign out of the yard, came back, dialed the phone. So now you know how old I am. <laughs> dialed the phone, bought the house, no money down because we had no money. And that was the beginning of the real estate career. So I've been doing this since I was 18, first residential, first commercial was 25. And, uh, you know, flash forward from 40 years after starting, I do one thing right now, which is the residential assisted living. Now, when you, like, when you mentioned you got involved in real estate, residential, things like that, that was from a traditional retail standpoint. You typically dealt with homeowners who wanted to buy or sell, correct? Well, the very first one was for our own purpose. Yeah. So we used it. It was mixed use. Then the next one was a fix and flip. So it was you know, buy it, fix it, sell it. And uh, after that, it was buy and hold. So it was the combination of all of those. Gotcha, gotcha. Because you obviously did not start out in residential assisted living. Oh, no, no. That wasn't until, yeah, I first heard about that about 20 years ago, but it wasn't until seven years ago that I actually got my first home. How did, and when people think of real estate, and I'm sure you're probably well, well aware of this, the real sexy things about real estate are wholesaling, fix and flips, buy and holds, as you see over my shoulder. Yeah. Uh, that, that's kind of what we teach people about. Uh, those are the real hot buttons that you see online. Uh, mm -hmm. How does somebody like yourself stumble and trip and come across this as an investing strategy? Where did this whole thing come from? Well, I'll give you that, that side of the story because the beginning goes all the way back. Uh, sure, sure. Real estate for, you know, the 40 years in between. But Correct. As I mentioned, 20 years ago, I saw a guy in a presentation talking about real estate like we all have. And one of the topics he mentioned was what we now know as residential assisted living. And I asked for more information. He couldn't give it because he wasn't doing it. He was just saying, you could do it. It'd be great for you to do. Mm -hmm. So from an investment standpoint, I heard about it 20 years ago, but my interest dropped until mom needed help. And that's when everything changed. And I realized that there's two parts to this. There's a real estate play, but there's a business play as well, the care of the seniors. Uh, so the real estate part uh, is very attractive because when you're doing buy and hold, and you all know that, your listeners know that, you wanna get enough rent to pay the bills and make profit. So in residential assisted living, you potentially can charge twice the rent. And the tenant is probably gonna be there for five years. The tenant's not grandma. 
It's not the senior in the home. It's the person who's running that residential assisted living business. Uh, you know, in the state of Tennessee, they call that a home for the agent. Uh, but in other areas, they call it different things. But that home is being used for a group home for seniors. And the person who's operating that business, they, they're willing to pay more because they're going to make a lot of profit. Uh, for, the, for the average person who's into real estate, that was probably semi-confusing. Um, <laughs> Can you can you talk a little bit more in terms of uh, kind of what goes into this when when somebody sure. is considering this as a potential investment play? What what you know? What are things that people need to think about? Uh, and I know that that's probably a semi-loaded question, but uh, where does somebody start? Sure. So and and breaking it down, there's two parts to this. So we'll focus on the real estate part for right now. The real estate part, you're looking for the right location is really the critical piece. Frankly, it doesn't, uh, not that I want you or your listeners to pay full retail, but it's not about getting a discount on the house. It's about her getting the right location. So the right location, we can go into details on that, but that home that's in that right location, if you're going to be the real estate investor and you're not going to be a part of the business, the key part for you is the tenant. Who is that person who's going to lease the home from you? So my big suggestion to you is you, sh you need to find that tenant first and you need to ask them, what's the location? Where do you want that home? And that's the home you're going to buy, not a home that you got at a discount. Because if that tenant is willing to pay a higher rent and sign a five-year lease with five-year renewals, I want to cater to them. I want to, I want to have a home that is exactly what they want in that right area. So I know it's a little different. Intuitively, we all listen and we're all talking about and thinking about getting something at a discount where we get it for less than what it's worth. We sell it for full value or something less than in this case, if you're going to do the buy and hold strategy, your tenant is not a family. It's not a senior. It's somebody who's going to operate the residential assisted living business. So finding that person first is the key. Where do they want that business? So then the home itself, single levels better than multi-level because the seniors that will live in it, they don't want to climb stairs if they don't have to. So single levels better, bigger is better, more bathrooms is better, and you can convert space into bedrooms and more private bedrooms is better than shared bedrooms. Now you mentioned somebody to find the person who's going to run this like so the idea is is that i have a property and i'm going to rent it to the person who's going to run the whole show correct correct and they are the so so this is an opportunity where i have a home and i could potentially double or triple what i would normally rent it out for because of what they are going to do with it correct correct and let's say double i don't want to get double. Uh, expectations too high sure <laughs> wishful thinking well, hey, it'd be, you know, that's just a, you can get anything you want. If you don't ask, you don't get. Sure. There's almost every time, last night it didn't happen, but almost every time that I speak to a group, somebody says, hey, I've got a house I'm renting to somebody now, and they're using it for this residential assisted living. I didn't know I could charge them higher rent. It's like, you can charge anything you want. You just never asked for it. Interesting. Now, what, uh, obviously when people do, investments in general they're looking for like it like in the traditional way hey what's the monthly cash flow you know there's a simple calculation on breaks down that gives you the cash flow how does it work with residential assisted living well uh and i'll give it to you rough and then i'll, I'll add some nuance to it if you're charging twice the market rent if you were making money on the normal rent list and i'm going to use a big number let's say it's two thousand dollars a month you're renting that house for and if you're making $200 in profit on that $2,000 rent, if you charge 4,000, now you're making $2,200 a month in profit, which is you know mind blowing, that's 10 times. Uh, so the nuance in the homes that we use, we typically use bigger homes. So it's not gonna be your average home, three bedroom, two bath, average home for an average family. It's probably gonna be the bigger home in the neighborhood or a nicer neighborhood, which, probably means you couldn't cash flow it anyway as a rental property because if it's a three or 4,000 square foot house that costs four or $500,000, the rent that you might charge might be 3,000. So if you're cash flowing at 4,000, you can't rent it for three. So you need to charge more. So instead of charging 3,000, if you could charge 6,000, well, now that thing does cash flow in a nicer home, a nicer neighborhood, 
and you're doing just fine. Of the of, and maybe you can answer this uh, for yourself included or from the people that you have helped uh, teach this to over the years. Uh, is it obviously I'm going to say it's probably easier if I find somebody and just rent the house to them and then they handle the whole program. But how many people would you say are wanting to not just own the property, but they want to fix it up and be the manager and manage this process as well? So how many people want to own the real estate and operate the business? Correct. Well, you know, it's um, everybody who comes to my class and I train, that's what I'm teaching them how to do, own the real estate and operate the business. But the reality is the biggest expense in getting started in it is the real estate. So especially for that first or second home, if there's somebody like yourself who's saying, look, I'll buy the real estate and I'll lease it to you if you're willing to pay that for rent and if you're willing to sign a five-year lease, it's kind of a no-brainer for that, that real estate professional. Uh, the operator of that REL, Residential Assisted Living Business, they're not thinking typically as much about the real estate, the appreciation, the cash flow. They're thinking about the business of it. You know, I'm helping seniors because, you know, so here's some of the math. Those seniors are paying, let's say, 4000 per person to live in that home. And it's not just a rental property to them. They're getting services. They're being taken care of. If there's 10 of those seniors in that home, 4,000 times 10, their gross income is $40,000 a month. So to pay you 4,000 a month for rent is uh, a small piece of that. So to his family, that might be a huge amount to that business. It's just a line item. Uh, so if they don't have to worry about the down payment, the fix up costs, the buying of the property, and they're just operating the business, you've taken care of a lot of that stress for them and being the tenant is acceptable to them. Now, you know, when I went home last night and told my wife about your presentation and how fascinated I was, uh, my wife's, and I'm sure you've heard this a thousand times, uh, and I didn't really know how to answer it uh, when my wife asked me, but her question was, why, why would a senior uh, want to live in a, a residential assisted living uh, property like this as opposed to go into the community and having those types of services uh, if, if in theory the price is the same, why would they come to you and your services? Great question. And when you think about the senior, uh, the senior has been living in a house, a home for 85 years, right? They, their kids have gone. Maybe they're a lot of times it's the, it's the uh, wife or the spouse. Uh, the husband's gone. She's there alone in this house with all of this deferred maintenance, all of this, you know, expense, big house that she doesn't need but it's home, so she sticks it out and stays there. Something happens, there's an incident, and now she needs to move into another place to get help. Uh, when you think about it from their perspective, they don't wanna to move to a hotel. They don't wanna to move to a country club. They wanna stay in their own home, but they're not capable of, they need care. So the, it's either you bring the care in and it's expensive or you bring her to. So what is she looking for or he looking for? They're looking for a home, not a hotel. They're looking for not a, uh, I'm in a hotel right now. If they turn this into senior housing, which is a common model for the big box, as we call it, I'm isolated in my room. I have to go downstairs to a cafeteria. There may be a pool outside and there may be, you know, places to gather, but it's a hotel. It's, it's not a home. They can make it feel home-like and put up curtains and so on, but it's still not a home. <clears throat> the second big reason why somebody would choose the home versus the bigger community is the care, the level of care. And what I mean by that is the ratio of caregivers to residents. There, the limit, by the way, and across the country is very common. The state says you determine how many caregivers you need. So in a big box facility, they may have 150 residents and maybe have 10 caregivers on staff during the day and maybe two caregivers on staff at night. So let's just say 10 during the day, 150 people, that's 15 to one. So one caregiver has to, in essence, help 15 people uh, and they're all sharing duties, but that's what, three, four minutes per hour that they can ever pay attention to one individual person. In a home like ours, it might be five to one. So if there's 10 residents, you'd have two caregivers during the day and one at night because somebody has to be there and available all night long. So it's really a home, not a hotel. And it's also the care, the level of care. I completely understand. 
Now, last night you gave some statistics in terms of uh, seniors turning certain ages and that kind of stuff. Can you talk just a little bit about what is happening in our country, life expectancies and things like that, that really make this a viable investment strategy? Yeah, the idea of the baby boomers, which we've all heard about, I'm one, and when you talk about baby boomers, they're aging, but they're 10 years away from being in assisted living. Right now, the people that live in assisted living might be in their mid 80s. They're a part of a generation prior to the baby boomers known as the silent generation. Uh, so they're in those homes now, but the baby boomers are maybe 10 years away from being in assisted living. A few are moving in now, but it's, it's typically 10 years out. So right now, there's about a million beds in assisted living in the United States. Uh, there are 1.4 million people every year turning 85 years old. So when you say 1.4 million turning 85, not that when you turn 85, you need to move into a home, but hundreds of thousands of people do every single year. But there's only 1 million beds, and those beds <clears> are full. They're building about 20,000 beds a year. So that inventory, you know, that increase of beds is not keeping up with the number of seniors that are aging. Then when the baby boomers hit 10 years from now, it's like a spike on a chart, what I call the silver tsunami of seniors. It hits the shore and it's crisis mode. And it's either crisis or opportunity, depending on the side of the coin you look at. Now it's, I mean, that, those, are incre those are incredible numbers, by the way. Um, one question I wanted to ask is, for for the people who were buying these properties, you know, kind of last night what you spoke about, you know, you you take these homes essentially because the reality is is in these neighborhoods, it's very uncommon to find a home that right from the get go is accommodating. Like you mentioned, uh, ten rooms. Right. So if I'm in a neighborhood where let's just say at best I found a four bedroom two bathroom home, how do we turn that house into a ten bedroom ten bathroom home? How how does somebody do that? So the first thing is the location of that house. So let's let's start with the demographics, then we'll go to the house. Mm -hmm. Because the demographics, what I'm looking for is how many people live within, let's say, 20 minutes of that home. Number two is the age group. I'm your target demographic, by the way. Not that I'm moving into the home, but if I'm 50 or 60 years old, my parent is 80 or 90 years old. I'm the one who's going to choose where mom or dad moves in. I'm the one who's going to write the check to pay for it. So what you're looking for is people who are not below average income, they're above average income, so they have the ability to pay more for mom and dad's care. They live within 20 minutes of that location because I want to be conveniently located so I can go visit once a day or a week versus once a year on a holiday. So a lot of people, upper income, and that's what I'm looking for. The home itself, let's say I find, okay, here's the neighborhood. The home itself, if we can start with single level, that's better, but it doesn't have to be. Whether it's 2,000 square feet or 5,000 square feet, you can always add space or convert space. So the first area you might convert would be a garage into bedrooms. So when I say a garage, you would level the floor, you'd take off the garage door, put in windows and so on. A normal two car garage could be two or three additional bedrooms. So there's space you can add there without even adding infrastructure, just finishing what's there, converting a porch into living space or adding on space. But the home itself, I'm gonna give you a rule of thumb, 300 square feet of living space per resident is very comfortable. That's not a 300 square foot uh, bedroom. It's just, if you had a 3000 square foot house, you could comfortably have 10 or 12 seniors or residents in that house. We're not warehousing grandma, uh, we're giving them very comfortable uh, place to be and care and the home is nice. It's upscale. When people come and do tours of our homes and they see it, they get the aha moment. Now I understand what this is, but it's a home in a neighborhood. A few other things you might do are widen doorways to make it easier to move furniture, or walkers or wheelchairs, grab bars near the toilets and the uh, showers, uh, easy to get in. So maybe there's a ramp if you need it to that front door. I would take out carpets, put in smooth floors so that it's easier to clean and maintain. Uh, there's things like that that you do, but it's not heavy retrofit. You should have smoke, well, you do have to have smoke detectors. Even if they don't require you to have sprinklers or fire suppression, we highly recommend it. I want those seniors to be safe in case of an emergency. So there's things like that that you would do, but from the outside, it's just a home. On the inside, a few nuances to make it safer for those seniors. 
like I said, there's there's obviously a lot to think about. I'm sure you have, uh, you know, for the people who come onto your program, I'm sure you have blueprints and uh, checklist things that they need to consider when customizing these homes uh, to qualify, correct? Yeah, we take them from beginning to end, like the location we talked about, what kind of house, what kind of renovations, the must do and the want to do, and everything that goes to it. What we don't teach people is how to be a caregiver or how to be the manager. And that's not what I do. It's not what I no. encourage you or anyone else to do. But there's people that do that. And that is their thing. That's They're not going to be a barista. They're not going to be a waitress or a waiter. They're going to be a caregiver because they love those seniors. And that's their thing. What I thought was fascinating last night uh, when you asked a question, uh, when you asked people to raise their hands if they have or know someone in terms of what it costs these people, you know, monthly to live, and people were throwing out numbers, you know, four or five thousand. I think I heard one person say like nine or eleven thousand. That's incredible. But what I thought was even more interesting, and you obviously will know about this, is uh, people have to like buy in to a community and then have the privilege to pay monthly. <laughs> and when you and when I heard numbers like two hundred, I'm sure it wasn't buy in for two hundred dollars and then pay four thousand dollars a month. We're talking like you buy in for two. Yeah, two hundred thousand dollars. Okay, so let's make sure we hear it. I know it blew your mind, and it was eleven thousand four hundred was the highest we had in the room. But there was wow. a lot of five thousand dollars. That was kind of the the sweet spot. Yeah. So per person per month. These are people in the room that paid that for months and years for their parent or grandparent. Uh, to live in a, assisted living. But those buy-ins that you were talking about, when you see a big box facility, a Brookdale, a Sunrise, an Atria, these large facilities and communities being built, that's a different thing. That's called a CCRC, Continuous Care Retirement Community. That's got a buy-in. Here's $200,000 to let me in the door. I like the way you put it, to have the privilege of paying you each month after that. <laughs> <laughs> and the independent living might be uh, $2,000 to live on your own, no care. You're just in an adult community with a golf course, tennis, and pickleball. And then if you need assisted living, then you move next door, continuous care, and now it's 4000 a month. And then if you need more care, skilled nursing or memory care, it's $8,000 a month in the building next door. And then when you pass away, that 200000 that you paid up front may or may not be refunded to the family. It depends on the situation, uh, but it is. Those are real numbers, and those are people in your room say, answering the question. Incredible. Mm -hmm. So obviously things are probably different state to state in terms of guidelines, restrictions. Do, does somebody have to have any type of special licensing or certification to put together a residential assisted living property? It is different state to state. There's no federal guidelines or rules. Every state does have their own set of rules and regulations. Some are, are more clear than others. I gave some examples of students who had never, the state had never ever done it. So we actually helped the state define and here's what it is. There's other states where it is very clear and less stringent and others where it's more. So let me give you some idea. Texas, in the state of Texas, in order to be a manager of a of a of a, a residential assisted living, your requirements are one: you have to be 18 years old; two, you have to have a minimum of a GED or higher; and three, you'll have to attend a 24-hour course. Now, that 24-hour course could take you two or three days, or you could do it over a couple of weeks, but that's a pretty low bar: 18, a GED, and 24 hours. In other states like Arizona, where I'm from. The qualifications are to be a caregiver, it's 60 hours plus. It's a test, TB test, uh, background check. To be a manager, it's an additional 40 hours of training, test, TB test, background check, the whole bit, plus two years of experience to be a licensed manager in the state. So one has a low bar, one has a high bar, but I'm not going to be it, you're not going to be it either, somebody else does. The caregiver, same thing. The caregiver, some states you need no training at all, just show up at work and you're a caregiver. Others, it's 60 hours of training to be a caregiver or more. The house needs a, a properly uh, accepted, certified, trained, whatever manager. It needs the proper caregivers. It needs to be inspected so it's safe for seniors. Then you need documentation on how you're gonna operate your business. Those three things together, the employees, the team, the paperwork, and then the safety of the house, are the elements you need to get approved to have a license. Now I'm gonna, I'm gonna throw some more yep. in because I'm guessing after just saying that, some of you are like, that's it, I'm out. 
not going to do it too much. And I, you know what? That's good because I don't want everybody. Not for you. This. Well, I don't want everybody in this business, but it, there are barriers to entry. And if somebody's not willing to do that, this business is not for them because it does take some effort. It does take the right person. But I'm not saying, and I said this right at the beginning, it's not easy, but it's worth it. You know, $10,000 a month in net income from a single family home. Most people will work months on a fix and flip to make their 10 grand. <clears throat> Imagine doing it so you, you work once and you get paid for a lifetime. Well, it's like you said, you know, the, you know, people who are doing traditional buy and holds to get, you know, maybe a few hundred dollars a month in cash flow after they've done conventional financing, that's relatively easy. Anybody could do that. And then when you put up numbers like what you were talking about, of course, that is highly attractive. But like you said, the reality is, is in order to get that income, there's more work that's going to have to go into that. You have to be willing to really go way beyond the next level to make that happen. Yeah. But I think it's the difference between, you know, somebody who's thinking short term versus long term. You know, I'm looking at your poster in the back there and you, you train people on how to do wholesaling and fix and flip and buy and hold. And I think that is the progression that people do because they start where they need cash now. The easiest Correct. way to do that is wholesaling. And then people say, I can make even more if I put some more effort into it. Then they do fix and flip. And then some say, well, hold it. If I'm going to buy it right and I'm going to fix it up, I may as well hold it and manage it. And now I've got that. So it's a progression. And the farther you go, the more money you make. But there's a tipping point. And there's a point, and this is, I'm older. You know, you're, you're younger than I am and a lot of people are. But the point is, there's a tipping point where once you get to a certain point, bigger is easier. More is easier. And when I say easier, it comes with experience as well. But the concept of, man, if I'm going to do all that work for buy and hold to make $100 a month, it's going to take me 100 houses to get to 10000 a month it would be easier to do just one to make 10,000 a month. So it's a, it's a shift in mindset. And some people do it when they're 25 and others don't do it till they're 95. Sure. Absolutely. Now, one question I wanted to ask you is like traditional real estate, you know, like for me, example, I own 31 single family properties here in Memphis. Mm -hmm. And with that being said, I could either self-manage or I could hire the property management company. But regardless of whether I do it or the property management company does it, we're going to put signs in the yard. We're going to advertise on Facebook or Craigslist and marketplaces, the website to attract tenants mm -hmm. with residential assisted living. When someone makes a decision that they want to do this and they're, you know, they're identifying the, like, as you said, location, location, location. Mm -hmm. um, how, how do you attract residents for your properties? It's probably not just as simple as, Hey, let's put in a sign that says senior <laughs> citizens wanted, right? <laughs> <laughs> Correct. It is not that. That's not it. So let's break it down to make sure if you're just going to do the real estate part, there's only one tenant and we're right. going to find that operator first. And that's a different conversation. But if you're going to operate the business before you even open your marketing, quote unquote, begins. So you need to have a website, brochure, business card, business basics, but you're developing your referral contacts. Because when you think about it, People typically don't, just like my mom, you know, the reason why she needed help is she fell out of bed and cracked a rib. That's the beginning of who's going to take care of mom. She can't take care of herself. So at that point, people look to other people for referrals. Where should I go? What should I do? So the referral sources might be doctors, nurses, caseworkers in those hospitals, elder attorneys, and so on. So we want to start to work with those people that can refer people to us because they're going to be, they're going to be asked that question. Hey, mom needs help, where should I go? So at that point, the referrals, but you do need to have a presence online because we always, we, we call the family of the, of the resident daughter Judy. And the reason why we use that term is there's typically a family of, of sons and daughters where they're making decisions, taking care of mom, but there's one person that's designated as the spokesperson and the final decision maker. We affectionately call that one person daughter Judy. So daughter Judy might be 50 or 60 years old. Now think about their acumen at a computer, right? Maybe they're on Facebook once in a while, but it's not like their thing. So they're probably looking to their daughter, granddaughter Zoe, to be on the computer, to be searching for an assisted living home in their area. So you need to have a good internet presence so that when the granddaughter, who might be 20 or 30, finds you, now they go to daughter Judy and say, look, here's the three best homes in the area. Let's, let's go show these homes to grandma and see what she likes. Now, 
Now, obviously in places, now I'm originally from South Dakota. Wow. And, and he, exactly, right? Uh, <laughs> you know, the win, winters down here in the South are not winters to, to people like us. So um, <laughs> last night when you were talking, you, you spoke of a, a person who came into your program from Minnesota and they came to one of your, your training seminars down in Arizona. And at the time it was must, obviously it was winter because it was like negative 16 degrees. Um, in Minnesota, do you, yeah. Do you ever find that people want to, you know, say for people like that, how, how many people are, find it more viable to do this in there? And I'm, and I'm talking about from the strategy of they're not just finding the manager to rent the property, but they're going to do the whole thing. Uh, is it, is it easier to say, Hey, I'm, I'm in Minnesota, but I want to go and do this in Arizona because it's just nice all the time, all year round. Uh, or, or does this still work great in places uh, like that up there, even with extreme colds? It's not a matter of cold. And you know, you said South Dakota, it's not a matter of warm there either. So the idea of when somebody gets older, they don't just say, you know what, I'm 65 time to move to Florida. You know, what they do is they, they just age in place. So most people, 90%, I don't know what the number is, but most people stay in their own area because they want to be near their kids, their grandkids. Some people retire, typically when they're able, they're independent to a warmer climate of Florida, a Texas, and Arizona, that type of thing. But absolutely, you can do this in cold states, no problem at all. The reason why Hal wanted to move is because he was saying, I'm tired of this 12 below stuff. And it's just, I think that's the realization many times. I'm originally from upstate New York. I live in Arizona now. But when you're in it, you just deal with it. You know, you chip the ice off the car windshield. You shovel the snow every morning. You, you warm up the car for 20 minutes before you take it anywhere. You're just in it. You don't even think about it. Once you get yeah. out of it, then you're like, what was I thinking? You know, that's crazy. That's nuts to do what I did. And yet that's what you do. So how was just getting a taste of that in the middle of the winter saying Arizona would be a better place to be when now, now you personally, you, you obviously you own the property and you're also the manager of this. Do you find, do you, I guess what I'm asking is, is do you find it through what you do that you form relationships with uh, the people who live out here, like kind of not, not like, Hey, we're bros or really good friends, but I mean, you probably go to the property from time to time and you have these relationships with them. They're not just your typical tenant that the property management company deals with. and You don't know who they are. Correct. All right. So, uh, first of all, I do own the real estate. And when you said you're the manager of, I'm not the actual manager of, I'm the owner of. So the okay. owner that, I, I, when I said, well, I, I apologize when I meant manager, uh, yeah, I just want to make sure the listeners yeah, that are right here too. Correct. You don't need to be the manager. As a matter yeah. of fact, I may not go to the homes. I typically don't go to the homes unless we're doing a tour on one of our trainings every six or seven weeks. But your question is cool. The idea of relationships with those residents. I will say earlier on when I was first getting started, there were more times where I would, I would be at the home and I'd spend a few minutes and it could turn into hours with some of these seniors. And I can't say a relationship, but I will say amazing opportunity to get to know these seniors and what they've been through and who they are. I mean, I've sat with people where they were telling me about all kinds of things, missionary work they did, uh, you know, painting that they did, places they visit, relationships they've had, people they've met, and it was fascinating stuff. And I think what was really interesting is, you know, after an hour of listening to this fascinating stuff, I'm thinking to myself, I probably know more about this guy than their own kids know about their grandfather. And it was, you know, wonderful for me, heartbreaking to realize that. And I knew that because I didn't know my grandfather very well. I never sat with him for an hour and said, tell me stories. It was, it was a different thing. So yeah, I've had the opportunity to have some really cool things that was more early on. These days when I walk in there, nobody knows me from Adam. They don't know I'm the owner. Uh, they don't know me as anything other than, who are you? <laughs> and that's probably, probably best. <clears throat> well, it... it it works for me. <laughs> well, like I said, we're, we're getting close uh, to kind of wrapping this up. <clears throat> is there anything that I have missed or is there anything that I should have asked you that you would want to, to say before we kind of get ready to wrap this up? Yeah, you know, there's so many questions you can ask. You did a great job, but I know that everybody who's listening, you've got different questions, different concerns, and I can help get you all the answers there. But the thing I want to encourage everybody is you're going to do something. You're going to get good at something. 
And, you know, again, I'm looking back there wholesale, fix and flip, buy and hold. You're, these guys can teach you how to get good at doing that. You're going to get good at something. But I want you to also be thinking longer term. You know, what is it that you're doing that you're doing today that's going to make tomorrow, and I mean tomorrow, 10, 20, 30 years in the future, better? And I know the younger you are, the harder it is to think that far. But I'll tell you, you're going to be there in an instant. And so start thinking longer term. You're going to get good at something. And our motto is do good and do well. I want you to do well, which is make a lot of money, but do something good that's meaningful. And I always encourage everybody to go with your passion. You know, we hear about that word passion, but if you're passionate about something, you're going to be the best at it. And if you're not, if you're just doing it for the money, figure it out so you can be doing something that you're passionate about. Others will appreciate it. Ultimately, you'll make a lot more and you'll do very good and very well. Real quick, this is kind of uh, out of line here, but tell us the quick story about when you went to speak or you, you were with Robert Kiyosaki and he was asking you advice on this. We talked just a little bit about that. Yeah, I was in uh, Jamaica and I was with the real estate guys. They do a, a summit uh, cruise every year and this was probably six years ago now. And uh, I was invited to speak. Robert was invited to speak. We're both on the same cruise, cruise ship. And it was in Jamaica and he just kind of came up and he said, hey, you're the assisted living guy. I've got some questions for you. And it was like a moment of Zen. It's like, wow, the purple book guy is asking me questions. And he had a property that he was looking with his wife, Kim, to either continue the lease with a big company or they were going to stop the lease and open up a senior uh, housing project and literally bulldoze the building and build from scratch. So we talked through it. I talked about the location. We talked about the pros and cons. And he did follow through with that. So he and Kim are putting up this $120 million building uh, complex, similar to what you talked about. Give me the 200 up front plus per month, that CCCR and uh, CCRC uh, building and community. So that was, that was the beginning of that uh, relationship. And, you know, last time I saw him was just about three weeks ago at a friend's uh, memorial for his wife who had passed away. And it was just kind of the circle of life of, just realizing once again, we're here for a short time, do something meaningful to leave that behind. Very cool story, very cool. Well, listen, I truly appreciate your time doing this. Like I said, your your program is very fascinating. It's something that, you know, like I said, I still have lots of questions, uh, maybe for another time, another interview, but uh, for anybody who's watched this and who's interested in wanting to learn more, Sure. Uh, how can they learn more? Well, do you have a, a way that not necessarily to reach out to you, but where can they go to get more information about you and your program and what residential assisted living is all about? Sure. And I'm going to give you a real easy website. You can remember it, but do write it down. And this is a place where you can go to the website. You can either download a copy of my latest book, or you can listen to some webinars to learn some more, or there's a phone number that you can call set up an appointment. So it's ral101.com. R-A-L, Residential Assisted Living, 101.com. Go there, check it out. Love to answer any questions. Get some great information. R-A-L, 101.com. That's not too difficult to remember. <laughs> <laughs> Man, listen, I, again, I appreciate your time. Uh, this is going to be exciting. I know, I know there's going to be somebody out there that this is going to click for. Because yeah. uh, just like you said, do good, do well. Uh, and it certainly is. So... You have a great rest of the day. I truly appreciate your time, and uh, I do hope to run into you again soon. Excellent. Thanks for inviting me, and uh, I look forward to helping anybody out there who this has caught their attention. Now, for the people who have stayed with us till the end, if you liked this video, please make sure to click the like button, leave a comment. If you haven't, exactly, right down here. Leave a comment, subscribe, follow us, and we will see you guys in the next video. See ya.